everybody's going to be in yes now everybody's going to be in listen only mode so any questions you have will be answered at the end of the webinar so when you do have questions just use the question box located on the GoToMeeting toolbar and uh, I'm going to start by introducing our speaker Christopher T Anderson uh, Chris is an attorney practice management expert legal technologist and host of the legal talk network show unbillable hour He's authored numerous articles and speaks on a wide range of topics, including law firm management, the ethics of cloud computing, and the future of technology in law firms. A regular speaker at Legal Tech New York, ABA Tech Show, and various state bar associations, Chris has more than 19 years of experience as a practicing attorney and is a former managing partner of a full-service law firm in Georgia. He's also served as an in-house general counsel and began his career as a New York City assistant DA. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris. Great, thank you, David, um, and thank you uh, to LexisNexis for for hosting uh, this webinar. Um, the I just wanted to and thank you for that that lovely introduction. Yeah, I am. Um, as if we're on uh, slide one, the one with my uh, with my photo, uh, I am a uh, an entrepreneurial attorney. So I am an attorney, as David said. I've practiced. I've built and operated uh, two law firms, and now I won't go around the country and basically work with other lawyers to help them, first of all, define their success, which a lot of folks who've gotten into the practice of law, who decided to open up a law firm or who work in a law firm, it's been a long time since they've done that. And then to help them achieve that. But I help people to understand that how their success should be defined for them. We define it financially. We define it personally. We define it professionally. And we realize, then I help them realize their dreams by building their law firms so they work for them and those who rely on them. Now, what I want to talk to you today is a little chat that I put together uh, a little while ago about how Moneyball, the movie, relates to the practice of law. But mostly because what I'd like to talk about is the financially in this, in this circumstance. How... Uh, you should be using your numbers, and not just money numbers, but metrics overall, to drive the decisions you make in running your law firm business. So I don't know how many of you all out there have watched the movie Moneyball, starring Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill. It's a 2011 uh, movie, about supposedly about baseball, but it was really about running a business and how to focus, how to use numbers to inform you. The movie itself was about the Oakland Athletics. Um, they were a ball club that uh, was not doing very well. And the uh, new manager named Billy Bean came, came in and uh, he'd been a former player. And so he became general manager and took the Oakland Athletics at $40 million a year budget, all the other clubs which were averaging, the average salary uh, base for all the clubs were $115 million. This was a challenge that, that really came to the fore when three of the Oakland A's best players were, uh, their contracts were over and they were up for grabs at the end of 2001 and they had to decide whether to keep them or replace them or what else to do. Let's watch a clip uh, first for the first clip from Moneyball. Sorry, give me one second. Not a problem. So they're going to be bringing up this clip. Just, just start it as soon as you're ready. Um, and what's going to be going on here? Okay, here we go. All right, here we go. Do you have audio on that? We do. Let's try this again. Beautiful. Johnny Davis. The Boston Red Sox see Johnny Davis and they see star who's worth 
does this movie have to do with law firms? What are they talking about? In this, in this clip, um, if uh, the audio cut off a little bit at the beginning, what they're talking about is that uh, the, the actor played by Jonah Hill um, is talking about that people are looking at all the wrong things, asking all the wrong questions in how they were managing their baseball teams. And that's going, that is totally and completely the same thing that goes on in everybody's law firms. Not everybody, just the people who haven't listened to my lecture before. But a lot of solo and small firm lawyers are asking all the wrong questions about their businesses. They're busy getting new business in or, or busy buying marketing without asking questions about what the purpose of the marketing is, without building a marketing plan, without having a plan for what's, how they're going to sell that business and convert those prospects into clients and how many new clients the, the operations of the business can handle without having a firm understanding when those number of clients come in, how many people they need and which parts of the business to service that business properly in order to give the clients an excellent customer experience. Without having understanding when they get that many people, how much space they're going to need, how many computers they're going to need, how much paper they're going to consume. All these different things they are just asking the wrong questions. They're using old-fashioned metrics, old-fashioned ways of thinking. When they think about marketing, they just say, how much more business do you want? And the answer is more. And when they think about uh, new clients, they say, how much do you want is more. And when you say, why do you want more, they probably say more money. When you say, how much more money, they'll say more. But they don't ask questions like, how much more can we take and still provide excellent service? They don't ask questions like, Are, do we have the capacity to even sell to these people? They don't ask questions like, is this business profitable or is that business more profitable? And how can we do this more profitable? For instance, how many of you on this call know what the cost is to service a client? What is the cost to run one case, whether you're in family law or criminal law, whether you're doing estate planning um, or, or transactional business transactions, what's the cost to run one case through your business? Do you know the answer to that? Do you know what your firm's fixed costs and variable costs are? How many of you listen to the experienced lawyers at bar functions about how to run your practice? Let me tell you, if you've ever asked anybody how to be successful, how they got to be successful in their business, make sure you ask them how they would do it again if they had to do it all over again because the two paths are very different and the common knowledge that we hear uh, out and about often doesn't have to do with following the metrics the way that we're talking about. So what are we going to cover? Next slide. What are we going to cover um, today? We are going to talk about the six numbers that all law firm stakeholders should know. We're going to be talking about investing, and if you'll just uh, click for the bullet points, investing time in your law firm. We're going to talk about law practice versus a law firm business. We're going to talk about developing a roadmap to success, how, to, how and why to evaluate clients, and what to do about clients that don't measure up to your standards. And finally, we're, the last point is we're going to talk about working within your budget constraints and how to look at budget constraints differently. A lot of businesses look at budget constraints as a limitation on what they can do for their clients rather than as a challenge that can be overcome by marketing more and selling more and not by doing less. If you remember nothing else from this, just remember this uh, basic formula that comes from Bob Berg in his uh, book, uh, The Go-Giver. It is one of Bob Berg's laws which states the amount, I'm paraphrasing, the amount of money that you make, the amount of revenues that you can generate for your law firm are directly proportional to the number of people that you can help and the depth to which you can help them. Next slide. What's going on out there? Why has this become more important? You see, up until fairly recently, 
being sloppy about running a law firm business was okay. We are blessed in our business. A law firm business is actually one of the least complicated businesses that we run. Law firms if they're decently run, if they're pretty well run, we'll throw off margins of 45, 50, even 55 percent. That kind of operating margin covers up a lot of malfeasance, or let's not call it malfeasance, it's a lot of sloppy management. You see, if you're operating a grocery store that operates on 1 to 3 percent margins, or a restaurant that operates on 3 to 5, or a retail establishment that on a great day runs on 7 to 10 percent margins, bad business practices show up really, really quickly because eating the ability to eat away at that margin just poof, it goes really, really quickly. But yet you have law firms that are run poorly, so what you end up doing is you do a lot of work and you don't bill for it. LexisNexis did a survey a couple years ago that showed that in solo and small law firms, 40% of the time that the lawyers are spending at work is never making it onto a billing sheet, is never being billed in the first place. So we're leaving 40% on the table right there. Now you may say, yeah, some of that's admin, some of that's marketing. Sure, some of it is. But 40% is an awful lot of time and you shouldn't be committing that much time to admin or marketing. That would be a sign that you're doing stuff that somebody else should be doing. Then, when we're not getting those bills out, we're not getting that stuff to the table, then we're, then we're taking a long time to get bills out and we're, we're sitting there and holding our heads about how, how long it's taken to get out, so then we're doing upfront uh, discounts. Oh, I can't bill for that. Oh, I shouldn't charge that much. Then when the client gets the bill, sometimes 30, 45, 60 days after the work's been done, then they come back and question the bill, and then we go do back-end discounts. And then we give discounts for them paying, and we're just losing money all along the way. That has been eating into the margin. But again, with those huge margins, that's been manageable. But something started to change. And uh, Altman Wheel did a survey. I've showed some of the results from that survey. Uh, and more than 90% of the firms that responded to the survey uh, showed that what they thought were temporary changes back before the financial crisis were becoming permanent changes and that they're accelerating. So in 2009, only, only less than half of lawyers that were surveyed thought that more price competition was a permanent change. By 2012, that had gone to 92%, and by last year, or this year, sorry, they ran the survey again this year, it was 94%. That legal work was becoming more commoditized from 25% to 90% today. That there was going to be more non-hourly billing. Only 28% of people believe that. Not, not, sorry, David, Sorry about that. Uh, more non-hourly billing, only 28% believe that in 2009, only six years ago. Now 81% believe that. And lower profits per partner or a slowdown in profits per partner from only 13% in six years ago to 48% three years ago, now back down to about 45% because profitability has been improving, but they believe that the lower profitability is still a permanent change. Basically, since 2012, the perception that the pace of change will accelerate has increased. More people believe only 60% in 2012. Now, 72.5% believe that the pace of change is accelerating. Leads to a quote from a good friend, Dustin Cole, who redefines uh, the law of insanity. I think we've all heard the definition of insanity, uh, which is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Well. The new law of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same results because we can't. We as lawyers, we as law firm business owners have to continue to adapt and have to continue to monitor our businesses to just get the same results we've been getting and do even more of that to get improvement. Next slide. So the, this starts with defining what the problem is. What metrics should a law firm be paying attention to? And let's go ahead and try our second clip. All right, here we go. Oh, 
understand what the problem is. We have to okay, replace. Good. What's the problem? The problem is we have to replace three key players in our no. lineup. What's the problem? Same as center bed. We've got to replace these guys with what we have existing. No. What's the problem, Barry? We need 48 home runs, 120 RBIs. <laughs> the problem we're trying to solve is that there are rich teams and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap, and then there's us. It's an unfair game. Now we've been gutted. Morgan Donuts for the rich. Boston's taking our kidneys. Yankees taking our heart. And you guys are sitting around talking the same old good body nonsense like we're selling jeans. Like we're looking for Fabio. Think differently. Are the last dog at the bowl. See what happens to the runt of the litter? He dies. Really, that's a very touching story and everything, but I think we're all very much aware of what we're facing here. You have a lot of experience and wisdom in this room. Now, you need to have a little bit of faith and let us do the job of replacing Giambi. Is there another first baseman like Giambi? No, not really. No. And if there was, could we afford him? What the fuck are you talking about, man? If we try to play like the Yankees in here, we will lose to the Yankees out there. Boy, that sounds like fortune cookie wisdom to me, Billy. No, that's just logic. Who's Fabio? All right. Who's Fabio? The real key wisdom from that clip is if we try to play like the Yankees in here, we're going to lose to the Yankees out there. When I'm talking about looking at our metrics, when I'm talking about law firms paying attention to their numbers, it is not to play the game like big law. That's not the way to win. And we are sometimes the last dog at the bowl. We don't have the marquee clients. We don't have uh, huge institutions, banks, financial institutions paying huge amounts of our bills. We don't have the ability sometimes to bill at six or seven or eight hundred dollars an hour. So it's even more incumbent upon us to be sure that we understand our numbers and we understand what the problem is to Billy Bean's question. What is the problem? What is the problem? What is the problem? The first problem I'd like to talk about is the cost of serving, servicing a client. Metrics that law firms should measure. What is the cost of servicing a client? And the way we determine that is first by asking very simply, what is our law firm's overhead? Go ahead and click through to get the, the text up. Um, how do you determine the firm's overhead? First, you do a, an analysis of the fixed and the incremental overhead. Now, I work with a lot of different law firms to, to do this, and it's always surprising that they uh, are often including things that are incremental in the fixed and the fixed in the incremental. So it's important to understand the easiest way to think about fixed overhead is what does it cost to keep the lights on if you've got nothing happening? What, do you, what does it cost to run your business if nothing is going on? That is your fixed cost. It needs to be allocated against every fee earner in the business in order to determine profitability. It's your infrastructure cost. It's your utilities costs. It's insurance costs. You know, most insurance providers don't bill you, uh, you know, a fraction of every hour you bill. You just pay your, your insurance up front every year. Uh, it, is, it is all those costs. And then you have your variable costs. What does it cost to provide service to the client? What does it cost to acquire the client? What does it cost in hours, you know, the, in the personnel that you bring on to service the client that you can reduce if you're not servicing clients? If you can't reduce it, it goes into fixed overhead. What does it cost uh, in paper? What does it cost in if you have to do legal research? What does it cost if you have to have filing fees? What does it cost um, in additional wear and tear on your systems, on your infrastructure? All those become your variable costs. And you put them together and you understand what it costs to service an hour of work, what it costs to service a fixed fee case, and you then are able to determine profitability. In general terms, when you determine your overhead, you have to break it out between what it takes to stay in business and what it then takes to provide the services, and that is your bottom line. That is what it costs to provide, and that's what you use to determine profitability. But please also understand that that is not what you use to determine what you charge. 
Let me give you an example. Let's go to a restaurant. Uh, usually if I do this live, I ask people in the town that we're in, what's their favorite restaurant? Since we're doing this uh, uh, on the web, I will use one of my favorites. Um, I like a restaurant called uh, Yasuda. It's a uh, sushi Yasuda. It's in uh, New York City in the in the 20s. I think it's a, the neighborhood is called Chelsea. Um, and it's got some of the best sushi you ever had. In fact, my wife and I have agreed that we don't call it sushi because then we can't eat any other sushi because it puts every other sushi to shame. It is fantastic. One thing I can guarantee you is that Yasuda-san, who runs the business, knows exactly what it costs to put a plate of sushi in front of you. He knows the cost of the fish. He knows the cost of the plate. He knows the cost of the sushi chef, which is sometimes him and sometimes not, to, to carve it up. So he knows the, fi he knows the fixed costs, the rent, the electricity, um, on the, the insurance, on the business. He knows the variable costs. One server, two server, three server, four servers tonight. One chef, two chef, three chefs, four chefs tonight. Um, you know, fish, all the variable costs. And he knows when he puts this plate in front of you that it cost him $8 to put this plate of sushi in front of him. Does he use that in order to decide how much to charge? Heck no, he does not. He charges on the value that you receive. You see, he's put together an experience, an eating experience, that is worth far more than the cost of the plate he's putting in front of you. For $8 in total ingredients, who knows, maybe it's 12 maybe it's 20 I haven't actually talked to him about his cost, you walk out of there paying $150, $200 per person because you're paying for the experience. You're paying for the value you receive from doing business with the Asuda-san. You make a profit because you're getting far more value than what you paid for, and he makes a profit because he knows that he can deliver that dish to you for $8 or $12 or $20, and you'll pay $200. There are businesses that do use cost as a basis. McDonald's, on the other end of the spectrum, also knows exactly what it costs using the same metrics I just talked about to put a Whopper, or no, oops, crossed that up, didn't I, to put a Big Mac in front of you. And yes, they do price it based on the cost, or at least with a great, a much keener awareness of the cost. But both of them are sure not to serve, at least not to serve very many things on which they lose money, though many businesses will serve something on which they lose money to attract customers on whom they can make a greater profit later. So knowing the cost of servicing a client are very important. If you're a high volume, low dollar practice, let's say you do, um, like un, uh, unbundled divorces or, or something of that nature. You may pay very close attention to cost and be running a percent profit business. If you're doing more high-end business though, you should be charging based on the value, but you use cost to make sure that you understand what it costs you to deliver the business so you never cross through the red line uh, where, where things start to cost more than, uh, than the money you make. So number one is the metrics that law firms should measure is the cost of servicing a client. Next slide. As I've been talking about, the metrics of uh, what it costs to service a client are the initial metrics that help you understand the next very important number, which is profitability. How much do you profit? And I recommend that you measure profitability on at least five different angles. Um, and I've got them posted up here. But probably you should slice and dice your profitability so that you can make data-driven decisions about where your firm is operating, where your law firm business is operating well, and where you might be able to improve. So first of all, by the firm, right? We just look at, hey, what's it costing us to deliver everything, and how, what are the revenues we're getting? Overall profitability. You want to make sure you're managing that, because there are some things you can do, particularly with fixed costs, to manage that. And sometimes it's by spending more because sometimes, let's say, by spending more in rent, you can raise the hourly rate or the fixed rate on all your cases by more, far more, than the increase in rent would indicate by improving the overall customer experience, by adding value. Um, so it's not always that profitability means cut costs in one of these circles. It means pay attention to one of these circles and figure out a way that this circle can drive overall profitability higher. By practice area, many law firms that I begin to work with are under an illusion about the profitability of some of their practice areas and operate practice areas for a loss. Now, I'll tell you, sometimes it makes sense to do that again. You may want to run one practice area at a loss because you know it, it, it attracts 
as long-term clients, the exact kind of clients you want to have to feed your high-profit businesses. But you have to make sure you're doing that intentionally and with an exact understanding of what the numbers are. So looking at it by practice area is very important. By partner. One of the things that I run into in multiple partner firms that's really uh, shocking when it comes out, shocking to the uh, law firm owners, not shocking to me anymore since I've seen it so many times, is that oftentimes the big rainmaker is a big loser for the firm. Profitability by partner is really important because just because a partner is bringing in a whole lot of money, a whole lot of cases, if that partner is not focused and if you're not helping that partner to focus, if you yourself are not focused on the profitability of those kind of cases, I'll tell you what, it is really easy to bring a lot of business into a law firm as long as you make unreasonable promises and, uh, and expect the firm to deliver on them so that the overall profitability of the case is, is driven down or even to zero or below. So measuring and watching profitability by partner and encouraging partners, including yourself, uh, on that metric really, really important. By client, it's the same rule, right? Some clients are profitable. Some clients are less profitable. We're going to talk later about the Pareto Principle and about evaluating clients, but just remember the old adage, the Pareto Principle is the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your work tends to come from 20% of your clients, of the work that keeps you busy. And 80% of your profits also tend to come from 20% of your clients. The problem is, unless you're watching this metric, it's often not the same 20%, and that's what can kill your profitability as a firm. And then by billing staff. This is the same rule as by partner, but this is by your associates, by your paralegals. Who is doing it profitably, and on whom are you having to do a lot of write-offs? Are you getting a lot of chargebacks? Um, or, or are not doing things, or are spending more time on non-billable work? How's your profitability by staff? Paying attention to these five measures of profitability is the second metric that law firms should measure. Next slide. The third metric that law firms should measure is what they are doing for client development and the marketing of their business. How much are they rededicating back to marketing? And this, for a lot of law firms, is their biggest fear, which brings me to our next clip. We good to go? Yeah, there we go. Scotty H. You're over 50 J. Cooking machine. <laughs> Are you liking first base, man? It's coming along, kicking it up. You know, tough transition, but I'm, still, I'm feeling starting to feel better with this. Yeah. What's the biggest fear? The baseball being hit in my general direction. <laughs> Not exactly the best coaching that could be delivered. Well, uh, hey, good luck with that. But the sentiment is really key to this part of the discussion. What is your biggest fear? Having a ball hit in my general direction. If you'll just hit the space bar to bring up the, uh, the content of the slide. Um, LexisNexis did a survey a while back um, of solo and small law firms uh, and even mid-sized law firms uh, to discover um, what they're doing for marketing. And they found that most solos and doers are limiting their marketing to personal networking and through their website. Some larger law firms are also leveraging email lists and directories. And American Lawyer Media, Legal Intelligence, and the National uh, Law Journal did a survey that indicated that only 3% of revenue is being spent on marketing. Can we bring that up? Uh, I'm not seeing that on the slide. Um, there we go. Uh, just keep, keep them coming, just uh, fill the whole slide. Uh, all the way down to the only 3% of revenue. So what does that have to do with what we just saw and how? why is this happening? I'll explain it to you because this sounds like a marketing problem, but it's not. Generally speaking, it's not. Now, when you speak to people and say, hey, you really should be spending more than 3%, if you want to grow your business, you should be spending 7%, even up to 10% of revenues. And again, it's practice area specific. If you're in personal injury, it may be a lot more than that. If you're in estate planning, it might be around that. There are some practice areas where it might be less than that. But 
as a benchmark, 7 to 10%, not bad for good growth. But when you talk to lawyers about spending 7 to 10% of revenues, they'll be like, whoa, I can't do that. That is far too much money to be spending on marketing. And when you, if you drill down into why that is, it has nothing to do with being afraid of spending that money on marketing. It's about the fear of having a ball hit in your general direction. What is actually going on is that the law firm is running in such a manner that spending that extra amount of revenues would hurt, would seem, would seem to hurt profitability. But we all should know that we shouldn't engage in any marketing activity unless it looks like it'll bring between a four and ten times return in profitability. A four to ten times return in profitability. And if we're running marketing in the right way, we should always be experimenting and learning which marketing things are working and which things are not so we can bring the marketing to the fore. The firms that I work with, once we get through what's working and what's not working, we always have a couple of things in the stable that we can bring out and basically operate like a dial on a stereo, right? Oh, we need an extra 10,000 this month, oh, dial it up to five. Oh, 20,000, dial it up to six. Oh, too much, dial it down. Oh, too much? Yes, that is what holds most firms back when you really drill down to it on applying the right metrics to marketing. That is a fear of a ball being hit in your general direction. In other words, if it delivered four to ten times the, the profitability, if it delivered that many people to sales calls, to calls of prospective clients to decide whether or not they should do business with your firm, it would overwhelm the sales capacity. And then it would overwhelm the production line. You wouldn't be able to choke that much business through your firm. So subconsciously, to avoid that problem, rather than fix the factory, rather than fix production, rather than get sales ready, the easier thing to do is to say, hey, we should not spend that much money on marketing. What's particularly enlightening, too, is the result that says that most solos and do is limit their marketing to personal networking and through their website. And when you talk to a lot of these firms, you'll also hear, and you'll, you'll hear, go, go to any bar meeting and say, hey, so how are you getting your business? And a lot of lawyers will tell you, and I know this might uh, poke a few of you in the eye, and I'm sorry, but... Uh, it's true, um, and say, I get most of my business through referrals. And like people are like, oh wow, that's so cool. I wish I wish that was me. I wish I could like have a practice like that by getting most of my business through referrals. And they're not hearing the real words. And the real words are when someone says they get almost all of their business through referrals, is I don't deal with rejection very well. You know who gets most of their business through referrals? The guy at the second window at McDonald's. That guy gets most of his business referrals. He closes like 99% of the sales that come to his window, right? Because he's not out there marketing, trying to drag people in, trying to improve his business, trying to improve the kind of clients he's got. He's just an order taker. And when you say, I get most of my business through referrals, what you're saying is, I am not willing to go out there and be rejected by new clients that aren't reaching me through my referral network. I am comfortable with my business where it is. Because you know if you went out there and got more, you could do better. You could improve the kind of clients you're getting because you could turn away the ones you don't want. You could improve the amount of business you're getting dramatically. You could improve the lives of the clients, of these new clients that you're, you're bringing in. You could improve the business for the stakeholders in your business. You know, those people who let you go to work every day instead of spending time with them. Those people who let you invest in your business instead of investing in your, in, in, with them. Those people who want you to be present in your, their lives when you have to be present for your business. Those stakeholders. You're not increasing your business for them because you get all your business through referrals. So knowing what your percent of revenue being spent on marketing is and knowing where it should be is a third metric that law firms should be paying attention to. And listen, if you don't want to grow your business, that's fine as long as it's a conscious choice. But hope is not a plan. And it, even if you want to keep your business right where it is, I got to tell you, 3% is the bare minimum. And that's the average. So half of you out there need to get to work. Let's go to the next slide. The fourth metric that law firms should be paying attention to is technology spend as a percent of total revenue. And let's go ahead and just bring up all the bullet points. Technology spend as a percent of total revenue. 
the uh, American Bar Association did a uh, basic trends report. They do it um, regularly. And they've seen that uh, law firms have increased their technology budget by 5% from 2011 to 2012. But on average, only like 58.7, 59% of law firms even have a budget. So that means that 40 some percent of you don't have a budget at all. And the average spend is 2 to 4% per, of revenues is spent on technology as percent of law firm revenues. The average capital budget per lawyer, the sweet spot was found to be between eight and $17,000 per year per lawyer. And these are just good, new, uh, good numbers to be aware of because you should be asking yourself, where does your law firm fit in? Now, a lot of lawyers are not yet uh, aware of the fact that the, uh, the 2020 commission uh, of the American Bar Association has made a change to the comments, a proposed change to the comments, the model rules of professional, uh, <laughs> uh, to the model rules, sorry. Uh, and that, that is that a lawyer should be aware of the technology that is available. That the, the model rule uh, on professional conduct says that no longer is it, is it okay to, to be aware or to, to be competent with your practice area, to be competent in the law, or even to be competent in the technology you use, but to be aware of the available technology and how it could help your client, and to be unaware of it, and to not serve your client using the best technology for the purpose could be a violation of the model rule on competence. Now, I think six or seven states have adopted this model rule, and that adoption is expanding quickly. Um, so it's really important to be aware of technology and to also be making that technology investment in your business. It, again, returns, like marketing, it returns many times the investment as long as, as it is made judiciously and for a purpose. You should always, with marketing, you should define the ROI that you're expecting, the return on investment that you're expecting for the marketing. Similarly with technology, when you spend on technology, you should know exactly what you expect to get out of it, and you should measure that thing that you expect to see if your hypothesis was in fact true, and you should continue to invest in that technology or marketing, and whether you should move that investment somewhere else. Next slide. So we've talked about marketing, we've talked about technology, and we started the whole conversation by talking about profitability. And profitability, I alluded to these measures, but I want to just go over them. These are five key measures that we have to be looking at whenever we're looking at uh, the profitability of our business. And the, these five numbers come from the first concept of profitability, which is realization. Realization comes all the way down through the the life of a, of, of a matter, of a case, of a project, of whatever you want to call it, of a prosecution. The first one I talked about, how much do you work versus how much do you bill? And we, we, we established that 40% of work, working time is left on the cutting room floor, never makes it onto a bill. Now, most billing systems provide the standards reports that you need to get these numbers. It's not rocket science to get them. But even if you don't have those, you can do it manually, but I warn you, it's very labor intensive, and it's better to use electronic billing systems uh, that are available uh, in, in case management software, like for manager or time adders, or in standalone billing packages. But regardless of how you get the data, it's important that you look the data. They're quick and easy to run reports and give you this information. So how much work you, you work versus how much gets billed, and then, as I talked about earlier, how much you discount, how much you write down before you bill, because for some reason you, you are not convinced that you've provided the value that you're trying to bill your client for, and it's going to be even harder to convince your client of it. So you write, write some stuff down. And then after you bill, how much do you write off when the client calls back? And then after you do all that, how much do you actually end up collecting? And then the last one, which is one that a lot of lawyers give a lot of short shrift to, it's what's the time to collect? Because I've got to tell you, if it's taken 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, you're extending interest-free loans to your clients. You are robbing your business of capital that could be used, for instance, to put into marketing to get more or better clients. Accounts receivable or, or, or extending time to collect is another uh, killer in realization. So you put all these five through and when you take your percent off of the number one and you take your percent off of number two and you take your percent off of number three and number four and number five, you'll soon find that your realization can be down below 50%.
That's when you go home and you look at your six-year-old, your nine-year-old, your wife, your husband, and you have to look them in the eye and say, you know what? Half the time, 60% of the time, two-thirds of the time that I go in the office and I'm not with you, I'm not giving you my attention, or that I'm exhausted when I come home, or that even when I'm with you at home, my mind is somewhere else, two-thirds of that, I'm just flitting it away. You've got to pay attention to these numbers because there's a lot of room for improvement in a lot of businesses um, and can be totally mitigated by implementing process after getting buy-in uh, from your stakeholders and your, uh, the, the people who work in your business. Remember, process itself is a form of technology. It's all in your control. It's just a matter of implementing it and finding someone to help you implement it if you need to. Next slide. The sixth uh, set of metrics that a law firm should measure is being aware of the industry benchmarks. We talked about one earlier, um, but it's about developing a baseline uh, to measure your law firm against the industry standards to see basically, hey, am I doing a good job? Because sometimes, you know, hey, some of you all didn't know that 7 to 10% was a good number to spend on marketing. Some of you all didn't know that 4% was a good number to spend on technology. Some of you did, don't know, for instance, what the right amount of overhead, uh, the percent of overhead should be being paid to salary. What percent of your total law firm revenue should be going out to salary? Do you know that number? Well, you should. Um, and the best way to develop a budget, if you don't have one, is to use these be benchmarks that include all your inflows and outflows that help you determine partner net income based on all the things that go in and all the things that come out. Notice I didn't say revenue and expenses. It's important to be more specific to inflows and outflows because the money received in by a law firm can usually include more than one income stream and some outflows include more than costs that pertain to the law firm. For instance, buying assets and payments for client advances won't fit neatly into the revenue versus expenses categories. Another industry benchmark that most uh, stakeholders care about is income per partner, like I was mentioning, and according to uh, an article called uh, Industry Benchmarks, that's by Peter Roberts uh, from the Washington State Bar Association, he describes a partner's net income as coming from compensation, fringe benefits, and retirement plan contributions on the cost side, and those need to be removed from the generated revenues to figure out exactly um, what uh, what's going on uh, with that partner's business. The, uh, there's so many benchmarks, um, and you know, we're already 44 minutes into this. What I want to do is refer you uh, to the resource at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's from the Washington State Bar. It's a fantastic uh, set of benchmarks. Um, and, uh, these slides are available, and you can certainly email me at the end of it, and I'll give you this, uh, this link as well if you don't have time to write it down. But it's from their Law Office Management Assistance Program. Um, and it's uh, the benchmarks for your law firm. Fantastic resource, and I recommend you to it. Next slide. So when we go through it all, and we, we've already talked about that uh, law firms with uh, between 1 and 75 attorneys, the average total expenses as a percent of revenue, remember I said a well-run law firm can give you 45, 50, 55%. Let's use that lower number, 45% uh, margin. So we've got 55% uh, is the average total expenses and which makes the average income to the lawyers about 45%. Of those expenses, two-thirds are from salaries. 36% to lawyers, about 30% to staff and paralegals. 10% is for occupancy costs, rent, et cetera. 4%, as you said, should be going to technology. Um, so that leaves about 20%, if I do my math right, uh, 66, 76, 80, right? I use about 20% to go into marketing, insurance, education, et cetera. You've got to make choices, and you've got a limited pool to make them from, but you've got to protect that 20%. Now you can start to see that, well, we've got these margins, but we, now we've got 20% of discretionary spending, if you will, and we've got to make careful decisions about exactly how to spend that. Being aware of these benchmarks, being aware of where you should be is a good and important first step on the path to making good choices. When we talk about profitability, next slide, we also have to pay attention to the five key drivers of law firm profitability. And this is uh, from a uh, piece by uh, James Cotterman of Altman Wheel um, called Calculating Profitability. But basically, you've got to be looking at the production value, um, what it takes, the standard value of production, your, your rate times the hours that you're producing is the expected production that a lawyer, paralegal, or other timekeeper can give you. Then you measure the utilization, how much of their time is actually making it onto a bill, right? 
Um, so, you know, okay, I make $300 an hour, I work eight hours a day, I should be able to generate $2,400 a day, but I don't, my actual utilization is only six hours a day, which is $1,800. Then we have realization, which we've already discussed about how that initial billable uh, goal is cut, 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 cut by all the things that are completely within your control and shouldn't exist or should barely exist. Then leverage, how many of these staff do you have per partner to help pro uh, leverage up partner income? And then finally, what is your actual, what are your actual margins? Paying attention to these five key drivers of law firm profitability, again, by the five kinds of profitability that we talked about at the beginning, help you to understand the numbers that you need to be applying to your business to run your practice more like a business that works for you. Next slide. And then think about the other investment that you make. We've talked about making investments of money, but you also need to be talking about how you invest your time. What do you do with your time, and how does that impact your profitability in your business? Let's look at the next clip. All right, do you believe in this thing? Do you believe in this thing? When you are making decisions, all right, Billy Bean there is look, thinking about you know what, what his real value is and whether or not he should be making these decisions based on the numbers. And he just asked that question, do you believe in this thing? I believe in this thing. I believe that making decisions about how you spend your time, how you spend your money, how you make your investments, how what your profitability is, is key. And I live by that. And I watch law firms who adopt these methodologies do better, increase their revenues, double their revenues, decrease the amount of time they spend working in their business, and best of all, increase their ability to reach their professional goals. Let's uh, go all the way to slide 15. Let's uh, just bounce two slides. And they do this by focusing very, very clearly on what they do to invest their time in their business. What I've listed here are really the basic important things that happen inside a law firm. And the way to think about it is this. You have somebody who counts on you for their time. I'm going to just use my eight-year-old son as an example. You could have this conversation with your own imaginary people. Um, my eight-year-old son's not imaginary, he's real, but uh, for the purposes of this, we'll just treat him as a character. And he wants to go to summer camp, and I'm the partner in a law firm. He wants to go to this really nice summer camp. He's had his eyes, we've looked at the brochure, we're really excited about it, and I'm about to have a conversation with him to say, you know what, you can't go. And he says, Daddy, why not? And I say, well, son, we can't afford it. And he says, but daddy, you're the partner in a law firm. Certainly, certainly you can afford it. It looks like a really nice law firm, and you're a partner. You should be making lots of money. And I say, yes, yes, that's true. But, you know, I've talked to this guy, Anderson, and uh, I've realized something. And I kind of know why we're not affording it, but there's nothing I can do about it right now. What? What, what are you doing, daddy? What, what have you realized? Well, you see, while I am a partner in the law firm, sometimes I pick up the phone when it's ringing, and I don't have an appointment to speak to the person on the other end. Yeah? Yeah, well, what I realize is when I do that, the most value I can bring to my business is the least amount I could pay someone else to do that job competently. And by competently, I mean to my standards. And you see, I could pay someone to answer the phone like $12 an hour. So when I answer the phone, and you know what? I kept track, and I do that. Like, I do that two or three times a day for an average of about 
45 minutes a day, let's say, times 10 days every two weeks, that's 450 minutes over two weeks, that's seven hours, that's almost a full day. So for one day of my two weeks, I'm a receptionist and I only bring $12 an hour to my business. Oh, okay, but then you're a partner. Well, no, not exactly, because I actually also do my own books. And this conversation goes on to where we realize that, you know, we spend a day doing the books, um, managing the office, uh, opening my own email and mail, and before you know it, I've, I spend four to five days on administrative stuff. Then I return client phone calls to inform them of the progress of their case, and I draft discovery demands. And I draft regular old legal documents, stuff that associates and paralegals should be doing. And I spend another two to three days on that. So that I'm only spending one or two days on marketing and client development, maintaining client relationships, strategically planning my, my firm, and strategically managing my firm, and maybe, maybe, maybe doing the kind of legal work for which I want to be known. But I'm only spending one or two days, maybe two and a half on that. You see, so then I turn to my side and say, see, I'm only a law firm partner two out of ten days, 20% of the time. The rest of the time I'm making, you know, ten, twelve dollars an hour, sometimes fifteen, sometimes even thirty. But not enough to pay for that kind of summer camp. I'm sorry. And we learn, you know, that by delegating these tasks, by delegating these tasks and getting rid of the lower value tasks, we can improve the law firm's profitability. We can improve how we invest our time. Well, I can't go hire all these people, says you, which a lot of people say, and that's true. So you start somewhere. If you are answering the telephone when it rings and it's not someone who has an appointment with you, start there because you don't even have to hire a full-time person. And that one returns 20 times your investment as long as you promise yourself that for those 450 minutes or 300 or 600, whatever your number is, you will dedicate that time exclusively to marketing, to selling, to developing and maintaining client relationships by bringing the greatest value you can to your firm, you will get a 20 times return on that investment. Let's say it's just 10 times return. Then you take that profitability and you apply it to the next thing. Then you get someone else to do your bookkeeping, please. You get somebody else to do your opening your mail, to, to going and getting the mail, to organizing your desk, to doing the client service, to doing the low-level legal work, to doing the mid-level legal work. You work your way up the ladder. It's not something that happens overnight, but it's something that can happen in 12 to 18 months, and your profitability will skyrocket. Paying attention to that is absolutely key. All right, we're going to go over one more topic to uh, the bonus topic, which is client evaluation. And I'll go over because I mentioned it to you, but we only have a couple of minutes, so I want to go through this real quick. This is the last way, the last thing to pay attention to. And this is bringing us back to the Pareto Principle. On, uh, so if you'll, yeah, if you'll advance to slide 17, um, for how you can improve profitability by paying attention to these numbers. You have in your business all sorts of clients. You have great clients, you have mediocre clients, you have bad clients, and you can establish some metrics like how fast do they pay, how much do they pay, are they a pain to deal with, do they run my staff ragged, um, and you can do that by like how many calls per week uh, do, do they make that are, that are unnecessary. Um, are they, there's a bunch of metrics that you can use to grade your clients. You, a lot of people don't even really need the metrics, but you should use some, but you can grade them, and I suggest you grade all your clients on a scale of A to F and you use a standard curve. If you've got A's, you've got F's. If you've got B's, you've got D's and C's. You should be the most in the middle and then off to the tail. And once a quarter, you just do this. You rank every case you've got, every client you've got in the firm, and once a quarter, you take the F's and you fire them. Now, I get a lot of feedback, well, in my jurisdiction, you can't just fire somebody. Judges don't let you out. I understand that. So you start to fire them, right? And you start to identify them up front, too, and not hire them or not let them hire you, but you fire them, or you start to fire them, so that you make room in your production for more of the A's and the B's. And then, once a year, or sometimes twice a year, and with your stakeholders, you argue for why you should even keep your D's, and you fire them too. What happens now, you say, okay, wow, now I've got a firm full of A's, B's, and C's. No, you recurve. 
you're always getting rid of the bottom. You're always getting rid of the bottom so you can put more of A's and B's in. Because remember that Pareto principle I talked to you about? If you can replace, let's say, that, remember I said you get 20% of your profitability from 80% of your clients? That's because those are your A clients. And if you can get rid of the F's, remember there's just as many F's as there are A's. That gives you the ability to add that many more A's and now you're getting, you, just by adding 20% more of the right kinds of clients, you can double your profitability. And because the Pareto Principle says that you, the 80% of the busy work that you're getting is coming from a different 20% of the clients, there may be some overlap, but it's not identical, there's not identity, you'll actually get more profits for less busy work, enabling you to spend more time on marketing. That's the short version of managing your clients by the numbers. Um, I do a much longer version of it, but, uh, but we're out of time, so you can come see me at an at a, at a, uh, actual in-person uh, talk at some point. Let's play the last clip. Actually, we're, let's, let's skip this one. Let's go all the way to the uh, clip for slide 19, and then we'll finish up. The ball went 60 feet over the fence. He's got no idea. How can you be romantic about baseball? Good act. How can you be romantic about the practice of law? How can you be passionate about helping lawyers improve and build businesses that work for them? Because you can. Because the law, let's go keep on slide uh, 17, please. 19, sorry, slide 19. Because the <laughs> because the law is a remarkable profession. But we all get used to what is comfortable. We all get used to the way our businesses are run. We all get used to the way our predecessors have done it, and it doesn't work that way anymore. And so we work hard, and we believe in the doctrine of sacrifice. We believe that working hard is its own reward. But is that truly what we're working for? Is that why we went into business? We are lo we've lost touch with our definition of success. What does our su definition of success tell us we want financially out of our law firm business? What does our definition of success tell us we want personally as far as time to do the things that we enjoy doing out of our law firm business? What does our definition of success tell us that we want professionally? What do we want to do to change the world? Next slide. And uh, bring up the, the text on, on the next slide. And it all goes back to why we went to law school in the first place. Why did you go to law school in the first place? Do you remember? Has it turned out that way? Or are you, like many of my friends and colleagues, working harder than you ever thought you would to earn less than you ever dreamed you could? But worst of all, you're not making the difference in the world that you planned to. It all comes down to managing your business to work for you.
By managing your business to work for you, you afford yourself the profits, you afford yourself the time, and you afford yourself the ability to really make a difference in the world. And that's what it's all about. And that's Moneyball. So uh, I know we're right at the uh, end, but I'll be glad to stick around for some questions um, and uh, hope that you have some. Uh, in the meantime, if you bring up, yeah, the next slide, uh, you can all reach me if you have questions that we don't get to at, uh, actually, you know what, I, I typed that email address wrong. It's just Christopher at HowToManageASmallLawFirm.com. It's Christopher at HowToManageASmallLawFirm.com. Um, and there's a free gift to you. You can go to uh, HowToManageASmallLawFirm.com slash four stages of your firm. Um, and you can also hear more. I do a monthly podcast on the Billable Hour. It's uh, at the Legal Talk Network. Um, if you just Google Unbillable Hour, you'll find it. Um, and I'll be glad to take some questions. So, Chris, since we are, uh, we're just a little bit over time here, what I want to do is um, let people just type in their questions. We'll keep it open for a few minutes, and I'll send those to you. And as we send out the recording and the slide deck to everybody, um, then we will uh, have those answered and, and include that document within the other other links as well. Is that okay with you? That's absolutely great. Yeah, but yeah, if, and if one comes up that's particularly uh, cool while we do that, I'll be glad to answer it live. But yeah, we'll, I'll be glad to submit some written uh, answers as well. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, guys, go ahead and uh, type in whatever questions you have now, and then we can um, uh, have those. There's one in particular that, that pops out while we're waiting for all the ones to come in. We can answer those. Otherwise, um, Chris will answer them all seriatim, and we'll have them out when we uh, send out the recording. Fantastic. And uh, I guess we could also mention that uh, we, we plan to, to present this live at uh, uh, Legal Tech New York um, in February. Join the LexisNexis uh, educational track at, uh, and come see the booth um, for LexisNexis for a manager and, and other LexisNexis products at, uh, at Legal Tech New York in February. That's right. It will be a full session, and uh, it will be CLE accredited. Uh, we, we predict at that time as well. So if you guys want to stop in and see it all live and, and talk to Chris one-on-one, -on -one, and then maybe he can uh, take you out to sushi to that place he mentioned earlier. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm sure it's pretty inexpensive. Yeah, I'm sure as long as uh, you, what, are you committing to Lexus paying that bill, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> so here is, uh, here's, here's a guy uh, that asks a question here. It says, so where do I start? I have a billing software program, piece of law, of course, uh, what's next? So Chris, that's a great question, and people ask this all the time. So I have this software program. How can I leverage this technology to get started down this track of, of, of analyzing my data? Is that, is that a good first step? Is there something you can do with that to, no, to, that, get, that's, to get that first that's, thing? That's actually not the first step. That's the first step that some people take. Um, the first step is just mind-shatteringly complicated. It's tracking the data. Now, PC, uh, PC Law is a great tool to enter the data, but you first have to establish a culture, a rule, a policy, and a procedure in your business to track the data. You've got to track your time. And this is true whether you're doing hourly billing or not doing hourly billing, because until you start to track the time and the expenses that go into a case, but primarily time, you have no idea of the costs. So make it an un- Mutable, an immutable rule, and not at the end of the month, and not at the week, and honestly not at the end of the day, that you and everybody contemporaneously tracks your time on how you perform every single case so that you can see where you're wasting time. You can see where the work in that matter should be being done by someone at a different level, even if you're the only person at the firm. You're, you're mapping it out for the future. So as you track your time, you should say, this should be being done by a paralegal. This should be being done by, a, uh, by an associate. This should be being done by, by an admin. And let me tell you, we actually did a study with this. If, if you're having a hard time tracking your time, it would actually make you a profit. It would actually be profitable to hire somebody at $12, $13, $14 an hour whose only job it is 
to watch you work and to write down everything you do, including the time it takes. That person is free to your business because to, for them to increase your bill, uh, your, your, your realization by 14 or $15 an hour is a no-brainer. Truth is that you actually get an extra warm body around who could do other things than just that, and so you make a profit on them as well. But just having someone watch you and write it down for you would be profitable if you can't get yourself to do it yourself. So that's the first step. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, so we have a couple, definitely some people sticking around. Um, so Chris, if you want to, we can answer one more question. We have a few Happy more to. that we can. Okay, okay. Uh, our firm gets most of our cases from referrals, and I am trying to sell the concept of spending money on marketing to owners. Where do you recommend we focus our dollars to get new cases? We have a website blogs, some minor social media, and we do some minor marketing through sites like avoandlawyers.com. What other types of advertising give the best bang for the buck? FYI, we're a small workers' compensation firm. The answer, unfortunately, is the answer to that is it depends. <laughs> the lawyer answer, right? It depends on your market. It depends on the size of your business. It depends on the kinds of clients. You know, the workers' comp, that I've got a fair idea. Uh, you're going out after, but it depends on you know the businesses that they operate in. You know, are you in a mill town? Are you in a mining town? Are you in a uh, manufacturing town? Are you in a high tech town? Um, and the way you're going to reach these people is different depending on every single uh, part of the market. This is why marketing is so important to understand from a local basis and to work with someone or to gain the expertise yourself as to what to do. But the most important thing I can say is that marketing is experimental. I can never tell you that this marketing will work. For some people, Avo works great, and for some people, it's a bomb. For some people, Yelp works great, and for some people, it's a bomb. For some people, billboards, some people not. Some uh, is it Yellow pages, yes, no, I'm not a big fan. But it uh, the, the mix is different. What I can tell you is there's six main marketing techniques you should use, um, and you should use a mix of them. And uh, you know, quite honestly, like I said, that's a, little, that's a short answer. I can give a longer answer um, when, when I type it. I also recommend that you uh, check us out at howtomanagesmalllawfirm.com. Um, there's a lot of marketing help there, and, uh, and I'll be glad to engage with you a little bit further. Absolutely. And, and guys, um, everybody who's, who's still on, thank you for your patience, and thanks for sticking around. we got a lot of great info. There's going to be more to come because um, – after this webinar is over, we're going to share the deck with you, obviously. We'll have a YouTube link with the full webinar. And we're also going to be generating some uh, infographics, a full white paper based on today's information. And we'll, as a bonus, we'll send out a previous uh, webinar that we did called The Happy Lawyer's Guide to Running Your Firm Like a Business. One of the points of running your firm like a business is using data analytics, which Chris covered in depth today. But we also have eight other points to um, running your firm as a profitable business. That, that'll be a bonus for, um, for your uh, for coming around today. And we'll get that out to you when we get the recordings out as well. So um, please don't forget to complete our survey. Your feedback is very important to us and will help in planning our future webinars. And with that, we're done. Thanks again for your time. Have a great rest of the week. And don't forget, Chris will be presenting this again at Legal Tech New York in February. Thanks very much, David. Good luck, everybody. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone.